This morning, I wanted to kind of give you a, a little bit of some hope and energy, I hope. <laughs> That's what I think we all need right now. Um, I wanted to open with the fact that I did write a book, and it's kind of a fun one. It's called Cowgirl Power, if we can put that up on the screen, but this is the name of the book. And the book is really a story of me starting a business from the ground up. It's an entrepreneur story. So although it was targeted to women it certainly has appeal across uh, all types of folks and I have to give you a little funny story about why cowgirls and why did you want to put that in a book well yes I am a Texan but um, I grew up in a small town in East Texas my parents were both from Missouri and when I was born in Texas they decided that I was going to be a real Texan and a real cowgirl so I was introduced to horses and riding horses and literally this is me on the front porch of our house when I was about three years old, all dressed up in my cowgirl regalia, and I laugh and say this was not a Halloween costume. This was how they dressed me a lot of the time. And so literally I grew up around horses and around people who I had a lot of respect for who had good work ethic and who really understood uh, how to do business in a way that was very honest and, and ethical. So uh, that's why I loved cowgirls. So that's why I wrote Cowgirl Power. And part of what I did uh, in researching this was visit the Cowgirl Museum in Fort Worth, Texas, which is a wonderful museum, by the way. And I reintroduced myself to some amazing women who had lived in the late 1800s and competed against men in international rodeos and Wild West shows and competitions all over the world. They were really our very first international female superstars from the United States. Here is a photograph of one of my absolute favorite of the cowgirls and I pepper the cowgirls through my story just to give everyone a glimpse of how tough and resilient they were, how much grit they had. Here's one of my favorite women. Her name was Fox Hastings, and that was a stage name uh, they invented, but her category of competition was that she bulldog steers, and she said, boy, if I could get a, you know, a steer, I can wrestle them to the ground every time, and what a tough woman she was, um, but one little backstory about her is that one time uh, before the opening performance, she broke two ribs. And uh, they said, oh my goodness, I guess you won't be going out there. And she said, oh yes, I will. And she performed for three days with uh, her broken ribs because she said, I can't let the audience down. I think about that so many times when maybe I'm down or I've been kicked by the recessions or COVID or whatever, and you think about Fox, and she said, but I can't let that audience down. For us, that means we can't let our teams down. We can't let our Rotary Club members down. We can't let our company employees down because they're counting on leaders. They're counting on us to be there through the tough times. And even when we're kicked in the ribs, we get back up. So one, one of the things I wanted to mention this morning is the excitement I have around current innovations because of what we're going through internationally. Because of COVID, um, one of the characteristics of a leader is, in my opinion, searching and always looking for trends. What's happening out there? What's changing in our world that we can adapt to, do something better with? Uh, one of the statistics that I learned yesterday uh, in a phone call with some health professionals is that due to COVID, 7% of all patient doctor visits are now done via telehealth. Now, who would have thought of that? We were barely scratching the surface on that uh, over a year ago. And now this is becoming a norm that's going to really help a lot of people have access to health care that we didn't have before. You take that and compound it with the technologies that are just emerging everywhere around home health devices. We have one at our home where we can take our EKG within a few minutes. You can find your um, insulin levels. There's so many at home devices that will be very inexpensive that you can hook up to, have that conversation with your doctor and achieve a really good healthcare outcome. So I'm excited about some of the things we're seeing and maybe we're zoomed out 
out and we're, we're going to be looking for those in person meetings soon, but it has provided some interesting ways to bring people together that never would have been able to get together before. Uh, I've given some international speeches and we've had many more participants just because we can do it this way rather than traveling people at great expense from all over the world to come to a conference. So as I said, we'll be back together as soon as we can, but this pandemic is starting to emerge all kinds of trends and as leaders we have to grasp those. Uh, one of the things that I talk about a lot in my book and in my journey in life is that the path to success is not a straight line. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm a big planner and I'm sure a lot of you are too. You, we like to set our goals. We have objectives and we have strategies of what we're going to do in our lives and our careers and our families and our clubs and whatever we're part of. We want to set those goals out there and, and march to those drum beats and get it done. But guess what? There's this thing that is called life sometimes comes and just hits us by the side of the head and COVID has certainly been one of those life experiences that came and knocked us back and I kind of like to do the analogy that sometimes I feel like I'm in a pinball machine just getting knocked around from side to side as life throws these curveballs at at us. Um, it's not pleasant sometimes. Uh, it's, it's hard and many times it can be a loss of a loved one. It can be um, a loss of a job. It can be the loss of um, something very important to you, or it can be something good that comes along you never anticipated. But those are the things that come along that throw us off this great path that we have and our own agendas. So when those things happen, generally what I have found is that I reset, I rethink, and many times I'm in a better place than I would have been had I not gone through that life experience because I had to learn from it. And maybe the objectives I had set weren't as great as I thought. And going back, resetting is sometimes a necessary thing, painful, but sometimes very necessary for us to achieve the most that we really would like to in our lives. Uh, I have to tell you about a story um, that really set my career in motion. And that was in 1989, I started my a little company, a little advertising agency that grew to be the largest woman-owned advertising agency in the United States. But in 1992, we started working with a small company called Dell, Dell Computer Corporation. We were in Austin, they were in Austin, and they became a client of ours. Very early on, we started doing all their catalogs. And I have to laugh and show you this catalog cover because that's me, uh, cheap talent uh, for the cover. But that was me many years ago. And as we moved along with Dell, not only were we doing catalogs and direct mail pieces and brochures, but one day I was sitting in a meeting and Michael Dell walked in. This was at the end of 1993, early 94. And he said, team, we're going to start selling on the internet because it perfectly fits our direct model. Well, it did because as most of you know, Dell's model was selling direct to consumer, direct to business, and that's how they lowered the cost of technology and made it almost ubiquitous. Um, before, you know, it was middlemen, you were going through retailers and it, it kept marking the price up. So Dell could offer these lower prices by going direct. So yes, the internet was a perfect solution. And we learned very early on how to harness this thing called the internet. And you talk about a newfangled thing. Uh, it was no one knew what they were doing and we had to figure it out every day, uh, walking hand in hand with our clients at Dell and learning how to harness this thing called the internet to market computers and servers and all the things that they we learned how to sell on the internet. So you march along and I worked with them for 16 years. My company grew around it. They became a huge client of ours. In fact, they became too big of a client. And for all of you who are business people, which you are, looking at your pie chart every month or whenever you do your financials and seeing how your business breaks down is a very key part of running a successful business. So I would always look at our pie chart every month and saying, all right, how much in my pie chart is each client contributing to our bottom line? One month I looked at Dell and it was over 52%. And I said, wow, that's not good because what if something happens? And if we lose that account, it'll devastate the business. 
So we kept going though, because we kept getting more opportunities with Dell and I didn't want to turn it down. So we kept letting it grow and grow. Uh, one day, uh, February the 14th, 2008, right at the wake of a recession, uh, I had a meeting with Dell and they told me that if I didn't sell my company to this advertising agency they were going to hire, that I would lose their business. And at that moment, I told them, absolutely not. I'm not going to sell the business. It's not the right time and I'm not going to do this. So folks, I want to tell you what a devastating moment that was though, because at that point, they represented $70 million of revenue for my company, T3. It was one of the most horrible things I've ever been through in my entire life. Uh, um, I literally went from being dark haired, as you can see in this picture, to gray in about two weeks. And so that's why I've been a blonde ever since. <laughs> you just hide those grays. Um, now I'm laughing about it. But it was a devastating time for my team and for me. And the only thing that got us through that was the connections that I had and the relationships that thank goodness I had built. So for all of you who are building relationships through your Rotary Clubs, through your business associates, even an international net of people that you all are connected to is the most important thing always in doing business. Because I went to every person I ever knew and I asked them, is there any way you could hire us to do this, that, or the other? And the most miraculous thing happened is that major Fortune 100 companies started calling and saying, yes, we do want to talk to you because we knew this internet thing. And they were starting to realize that during the recession, they could no longer spend all the money they were on television, all the money they were on radio or print. They needed to harness the internet as a more cost-effective tool to market. So my company not only survived, but we thrived. But it took that shoe leather, picking up the phone, tough, tough times to ask anyone I could find to hire us. So that's my story of Dell. That's what that was my kick in the teeth. Um, and I'll tell you, it, it, it changed us forever. And I always became grateful and never let that pie chart ever, ever get out of hand again. Um, one other thing that I love to talk about is that I realized that I'm a kind of a risk taker. And it's part of my DNA. It's who I am. Uh, but some of my colleagues and friends and other CEOs have confided in me that they aren't really risk risk takers. And so they've had to surround themselves with teams of people who will allow that risk to happen when it needs to. Um, I have a little slide I like to show. Um, when I was just starting my company in 1989, I visited my mother-in-law and I sat down to breakfast with her and I said, you know, Isabel, sometimes I think I'm eating risk for breakfast. Every day is a challenge and I wake up and it's just a huge risk to start this company and to run this company and try to make a profit. And so she listened and we had a nice conversation. Later, she walked into her living room and she said, have you ever seen this? And she picked up this little enamel box and this was it. It says, everything is sweetened by risk. And I said, no, I had not noticed that. And she said, I want you to take this. And I want you to remember that if you don't take the risk along the way in life, you're gonna miss the sweet stuff too. So I took the box with gratitude, left and went back to Austin and put it on my desk. It is still on my desk today to not only remind me that risk is necessary it's a good thing because without it, we will miss out on some of the greatest opportunities and joys in our life. We also will make mistakes. And when you take risks, sometimes you have to mitigate those risks and realize that let's make some fast corrections here and be prepared to do that if our risk doesn't pan out. But I have found more times than, all, than not that the risk I took were calculated risk and they actually paid off in big ways for me. So it reminds me of her and it reminds me of that great lesson. Another thing that I always share is that you have to listen to your gut. And I have found that during this pandemic and during these tougher times, I really have had to rely on my gut because I don't have sometimes that closeness of network of people close to me to really bounce things off of. It's one thing to do it on a phone call or Zoom or whatever, but I value that interaction, that personal connection. So I've had to go back to all the things that are deep inside me 
the things that I've learned through experience. Uh, and it's my moral compass. It's who I am inside. And we all have this. Uh, and it's a simple thing to say, but you really have to kind of start listening to that gut sometimes because it will guide you and it will always take you to places that um, maybe you didn't think you could go. Uh, the biggest mistakes I've ever made was when I did not listen to my gut and that usually had to do with hiring somebody who looked good on paper, they sounded good, they had all the credentials, but something just wasn't right and I knew it. I knew it in my gut. Once you let them in the organization, Sometimes things go well for a little while, but before you know it, everything starts falling apart. And especially if these people are in leadership roles. And then it becomes a very difficult task of weeding them out and telling them they're not a fit. And they may be a saint someplace else, but they've got to be out of your organization because they will absolutely destroy it. And so those are the times I beat myself up the most is when I would allow myself to bring someone in that I knew was not right because I didn't listen to my gut. Uh, one of the things that has been a hallmark of um, my career was very early on, I was working for four guys who'd gotten their MBAs at Harvard, and I was working with them in leadership training and uh, in consulting. They had a management consulting company and did leadership training. And the reason they did the leadership training was as they were doing exercises to help people in strategy and planning and all the things they were doing, they realized that at the base of all of that was the leaders had to be prepared to lead. So they developed these leadership modules and training modules and a lot of it was based on understanding your strengths and then shoring up your weaknesses by surrounding yourself with people who could do things better than you could. And so they taught me all about strength finders, Myers-Briggs. We really used Myers-Briggs back then. And I learned for the first time who I really was. And from that moment on, I just focused on what I did well. And I worked so hard to find people who would shore up my weaknesses and build teams of diversity around thought, diversity of thought and different people bringing different strengths to the table listening to those and then having a much more innovative organization and a much more diverse organization and we talk a lot about diversity today but i'm a big believer in diversity of thinking and thought and if we're all thinking the same and we're all the same on the myers-briggs or we all have the same personality traits you'll just be agreeing with each other and we have to have those folks coming in who are the contrarian, if you will, or someone who'll look at something from a different point of view and help you get to a better place. So that's something that I think if we're not looking at right now, it's a good time to reestablish those um, personality types, listen to different types, go through these uh, exercises in your organization. If you You've done it once, maybe do it again because we maybe all have a little different lens now after so many people working from home. And one of the traps that we'll find in all of this is the extroverts versus the introverts. Uh, if you want to look up, I just wrote an article in Forbes and the whole concept around the article was really about look out for the extrovert trap. Because as we go back to the office and we start going in physically for those who've not been there, guess who will be first in line to open the door with their lattes in hand? The extroverts. Because we, and I'm an extrovert, are starving for that interpersonal connection and being able to really talk to people in person and bounce ideas off. So the extroverts are going to be talking. They're the ones who are going to be there. What will happen to the introverts? Well, if they can still stay at home, they're probably happy to do that. Uh, so we have to be careful to bring them out, ask their opinions, get them in the conversation and make sure that we don't miss out on the deep thinking that they can bring to an organization. So it's not just the introvert extrovert, but it's all the different personality types. And this is a good time, I believe, to reevaluate all of that as we begin to move back into what we hope is somewhat of a normal uh, lifestyle where we're really working together as teams. Um, so with that, I really have uh, concluded my, my comments. I would love to take any questions if we have time for that, Richard, or I certainly would love to tell you more about what's in my Cowgirl Power Toolkit. Um, one of the things that was mentioned is that the reason I wrote the book was to give people some just real world advice on what I've been through and what it was like to start a company from the ground up and run it for 
30 years. Uh, we never borrowed any money. It was bootstrapped the whole way. So I'm not sure that model works for everyone, but uh, it was the one that we certainly did. And when I sold the company last fall, uh, it was kind of a nice way to exit into doing the things I'm doing now, which is a lot of leadership training and trying to encourage people uh, to do the best work they can. And I want to applaud all of you. My father was a Rotarian. I love the Rotary Club. I, I feel like I've spoken to quite a few different Rotary groups around the world, really. And um, I, I think the work that you do is so important. And I'm so glad you're still around to take on some of the big issues internationally that you do. So I applaud you. I thank you and keep up the good work. Um, you're you're doing good things and we all need you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your talk today. And by the way, I like the paintings behind you and I understand that you did those. Yes. And uh, and you, by the way, can be a Rotarian and I would oh, encourage I you to pursue it. With our club, we are going to stay uh, even once things go back in person. I'm sure we're gonna be a hybrid uh, online as well as in person. And so would love to have you be a part of us. So we do have some questions. Okay. And uh, one of the first ones that just scrolled off my screen uh, was a good one uh, because it was uh, talking about, uh, or you mentioned uh, Dell and, and what a big risk that was and how that ended up uh, working out fairly well for you. There was a question though about have you, or if you can describe a time where you took a risk and it didn't turn out as well and what lessons that you might recall from that? Well, one risk we took was the first office that we opened outside of Austin was New York City and that one actually worked out really well because I needed media people there that could place online media and so we grew that office and that turned out to be a good risk to take and that was a big one for us I mean here we were based in Little Austin Texas and you know to open up and try to compete in New York was a big thing uh, we did take a risk uh, and open an office in San Francisco and it never really got it never really flourished like it should have um, we had some success there off and on, but when we hung on to it too long, uh, but that was not the best risk that I could have taken. Uh, in hindsight, then I ended up opening later an office in Atlanta, and I should have done that first and not the West Coast. Um, we didn't really understand um, that market that well, and uh, it, it, it was kind of a, you know, lost cause in a way. So that was not the best risk that I could have taken. And, um, you know, and again, I, I took risk on people a lot of times. My business was totally around people. And when I would find people that were not really the right fit, it could, it damaged, you know, client relationships, it da damaged other people on the team. And so I had to really work hard to not let that happen. But it's, it's easy, some, you know, we don't realize it sometimes, but you let individuals in the organization that seem to be very talented, but they're, they're not right for that, that group. And so you have to listen to that. Um, but those were risks that, um, sometimes I took risk on people that I wish I hadn't. All right. Um, speaking of that, there was a question about uh, your uh, being, the, the fear associated with the risks and uh, they were wondering uh, what are some of the key traits of being a pioneer and being fearless, especially when there's fear in the way? There's always fear. Uh, we can always find ways to be afraid to do something. Um, my, my best advice there is to find people that you can really trust. And I call them your rough riders. You know, Teddy Roosevelt called his teams that went off these wild missions with him, the rough riders. And it was a gaggle of people from all different types and he would bring them together to make something happen. But when, when you're afraid, uh, when things don't seem clear, the best thing I can say is who are those people that can really tell you the truth? You know, and I call them the Rough Riders and thank goodness I've been able to assemble those people and they've changed through the years. Uh, some still are the same, but some of them have changed and you have to develop a relationship with those individuals where you can tell it like it is, they tell you. And it's not in a way where they're being critical and trying to demean you or hurt you. They love you and they care enough about you that they will tell you where they think that you're making a mistake or where you can do something better and uh, when you take that critique sometimes it's a little stingy you know it hurts sometimes to go oh you know I didn't realize I was doing that um, but being able to have those people around you confiding in them if you're fearful letting your guard down we've got to have those folks uh, and if we're always keeping up the tough appearance and the tough thing uh, it's not real 
and we're all vulnerable inside. We're all hurt. Sometimes we all want to cry. Sometimes things are so bad. So get those Rough Riders around you. Get it over with. Get them to help you, and they will they will help you through your fear. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, there's a question, and I think it can relate, and maybe it does actually relate to our Rotary clubs, because uh, these are all large clubs, and so we deal with some of those issues that you deal with in companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was what you uh, look for when you hire your uh, key leaders. And so this may be when you're uh, asking someone to be a key leader in a club as well. And so what are your key strategies for uh, retaining customers and keeping them engaged and growing? So it's kind of a two-part question, really. Yeah, the customer side is really interesting. So uh, let me go back to the first part of that, which is who would who do I look for and who do I what are the real characteristics of a leader that I think we look for? And uh, one of the things that sounds very obvious, but it's really not is someone who is very curious and they're always looking for how can they do things that are not just given to them you know they're looking for uh how can i improve how can i find new ways to do things and and they talk about possibilities and talk about how or maybe if they're a, in a leadership role where they need to really take a stand and be a strong and and organized and and move an organization so really what I would say on that is you find your own strengths or what's the strength of the organization and where are the weak spots? Where do you need to bring in people who can shore those up? So if you're really strong with vision and, you know, the big picture and doing all that, who's going to be the soldier troops coming in behind to make sure that those are executed? And so it's really kind of finding that, you know, balance of folks that um, can do it all together, you know, and building that team. Um, and so... That's the first part of all that. I love the question, though, about the customer relationships. We all have customers. And if you're leading a club, that's your customers. You know, that's your, how do you retain them? How do you keep them engaged? What do you do? Um, the strongest people that I ever found in any organization were the ones who could better the client relationship better the customer experience um, and create a bond there. We would work very hard in I always have to try to help our clients look better, you know, give them everything they could to win, uh, to meet their sales goals, to get promoted. Uh, and what, and we could be behind the scenes, you know, it's, you know, you're sometimes you're the one behind the scenes making this happen for somebody else, but that's where you really create the, these wonderful relationships and bonds is when you've given someone that, that, you know, oomph behind them that really gets them to where they need to be and if we focus there and you focus on customers I think it takes the fear sometimes away from us it takes the doubt away from us and it takes this kind of uh, unhappiness or sometimes this you know inward thinking so anytime something goes down for me or I'm feeling kind of low so to speak or you know that life isn't so great if I start focusing on the outside and somebody else and how I'm going to help them and how I'm going to make them look better, all of a sudden I'm better. And that's just kind of the way life works, I think. Okay, possibly uh, um, drilling down into that a little bit farther, Adeline from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I asked a question on succession planning, and I know you've done some of that uh, in your company. Uh, considering that the Rotary presidency is just a one-year term, there's some lead up and all, but um, what are some strategies that Rotary leaders can use in their clubs on a consistent course, not not to have to reinvent the rotary wheel every year. That's it. Well, I've been in several organizations where um, it's volunteer. You know, you're not getting paid to do this. It's because you love the organization or you want to give back to it. Uh, and I've seen this happen. I, I was a chair of an organization um, for, I was on that board for eight years. So I had time to prepare. But when it was all over, uh, one of my goals was to provide, uh, we did some strategic planning. And, and we set forth a plan that would last at least five years. And not that you wouldn't have mid-course corrections and all that but you, we set together that plan so that the and this was a women's organization so the women who came behind me were start were continuing to improve and execute on that and it wasn't starting all over every year we all agreed you know that this is the direction we want to take the organization so i think if as a strong leader if you can set those parameters and this is what we want to do and then you find your number two the one coming up behind you and whatever and they're whatever in training but you agree on that and you bring them into that. So 
that they can just start carrying on and then it, it'll kind of morph from one thing you know to the other because you have to make changes along the way life changes situations change economies change but it would help to have you know set that vision or that direction or plan so that others can start to follow in and and create their own next version of that perfect response thank you gay excellent by the way these blue light glasses really work my eyes are starting to feel strained all right so gay uh there was a question and when i first looked at it i was thinking hmm, but i kind of like it and i was wondering <laughs> if to a degree uh particularly with leaders in your organization if uh if outside organizations volunteer work was something that played into that. So the specific question that was asked was, how do you see Rotary fitting into leadership development for people you mentor or train? And I know I've had the thought on occasions, like if someone's gonna be a leader in an organization, in a country, they all need to be in Rotary. They just do, same the four-way test every week. But what are your thoughts specifically about uh, volunteer organizations and, leader and even Rotary specifically? Many times, uh... Richard and all of you, I've, I was asked, how in the world do you have time to do some of these nonprofits and these outside organizations when you are needing to be focused 24 seven on your own business? I have three children, you know, I have, I'm married, I have a, a lot going on in my life. And uh, even though I sell my company, I still do. But here's the thing that always meant so much to me. I learned so much from these other organizations and the relationships there because they weren't my company and they weren't my business. It was the camaraderie, the ability to talk to someone in another industry, someone who came from a different point of view, and that could really kind of, we, we had a common bond because we were all about something. So, you know, for example, when I was, um, on the board of the Salvation Army. You know, that was a cause and we were all kind of working toward things, uh, together, but, but just sitting around that boardroom table and having lunch with some of the other business leaders and different people was a very important part of my own development. And had I just been myopic and stayed inside my own cocoon and my own shell, even with my clients or with my uh, coworkers, I would not have had those outside points of view and uh, this infusion of new ideas and information. If we, you know, it's kind of like you can't be so insular. So the fact that you're international, that you have people you can draw on, that's a great gift because we all live in an international space right now and as the way we operate. So I am a big, big believer that I don't care how you do it, you got to step out of your place and you got in the volunteer work you do, any of those things makes you a better person. And it also gives back to you in big ways. I mean, just it's a fulfillment to me, but I was brought up that way. My parents were very big on giving back. And that was one thing they instilled in me that, you know, no one can take away. So I admire anybody who says, all right, I'm gonna take that extra, you know, three hours this week that I could be doing something else, but I'm gonna give it to this organization or give it to this cause or give it to this group because in, a, in the long run, I'm the one who is the winner and I, it pays me back. Yeah, true enough. Uh, there was a, it was actually almost a more of a comment than a question. I'm not going to turn it into a question because they talked about how their district, the Rotary District, offers a monthly master class to help meet the development interests of members. And so I'm wondering if you did anything like that within your company or, uh, or kind of what your, uh, and it may even expand that, not just the development of people, but I know you talked a little bit uh, once in our club about uh, the recruiting as well. So maybe you can discuss that and how you can use one for the other. Well, well let me address it this way. Um, what I tried to do and what my team leaders tried to do was foster uh, a real atmosphere and a culture of innovation and learning. And we, we rewarded that. You know, I had people who would say, like, all right, come listen to this TED talk with me, or let's read this book, or let's look at this, or look what I just discovered. And they'd be down in the cafe and show everybody. People would be gathered around and looking about some way that they were able to do something new or some idea they had. And we fostered that. We said, take time to do that. You know, you don't have to be just working on this client work 24 seven. I want you to really take time to learn things. And so we fostered that. We also had one vision and I know this sounds kind of crazy, but uh, I would always just say thrive on ambiguity. 
And that's what we've certainly had to do during COVID. But uh, I told everyone that guess what? We don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know what technology may come down. We don't know what situation is going to happen, what, what client's going to walk out the door because they lost all their business. You just don't know. So we will thrive in that ambiguity. And we will find ways to show our clients how to get through this. And many times we would walk into a client meeting and talk about things or show them things they had never asked for um, because that's what we thought would be good for them. And they didn't always accept it right away and say, oh, yeah, let's buy that or let's do that. But it intrigued them enough to say, this company's thinking about me and my business. And it goes back to that client relationship, whoever your client or customers are, you've got to be thinking about their business. And I taught my people to say, all right, I want you to learn everything you can. UPS was a client. I want you to read their annual reports. I want you to listen to their earnings reports. I want you to watch what's going on. And you become immersed in their business and then you can innovate and you can thrive in the ambiguity that they do. Um, and you know, that was kind of our mantra around uh, T3 all those years is that nothing's constant but change. So just be part of it. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, it's interesting. A lot of the folks on this call are not from the Lone Star State, but Michael Krent wants to know, it's kind of a softball for you here. Uh, what, what makes it so special about being a Texan born and bred? Well, I am the first generation Texan in my family, but um, I, I don't know. I just have had so many wonderful experiences because I was a Texan and uh, I was educated all the way through in public schools. I uh, went to the University of Texas in Austin and I'm still real involved with them. And in fact, I have a leadership program I'm working on with the University of Texas. But um, so I'm very, I'm very, very proud Texan and my parents instilled that in me too. They weren't Texans, but they wanted me to feel a very much a part of the pride of the state. And uh, I've just had so many, many great friends. But you know, the thing that worked for us is you'll all laugh a bit about this. Now, Austin's kind of been this hot spot and kind of in the limelight and the cool place. Believe me, in 1989, when I started T3, it was not the cool place. And it, it was a sleepy little town and there wasn't that much going on there. And to get clients to come to Austin was a big deal because it wasn't the place you'd go for advertising, you know, it was New York or even Dallas. But Chicago, but it certainly wasn't Austin. So um, it was sometimes a liability, but we made it into an asset and turned it into something that at least for us was a great place to be and to do business. The other part too is Texas is a very friendly place to do business and it still is. That's why so many companies are moving here because of our tax uh, situation and just because, you know, the Texas business environment is, is good. So that's one reason to be proud to be a Texan is that we, I'm glad we can still uphold some of those um, institutions and our, our policies so that we make it a, a good place to do business. It was for me. Thanks. Awesome. 